Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Fletcher Wright, the National Church of God. I want to welcome you to our Friday night prayer meeting. Amen. Praise the Lord. And you know, Jesus is our ultimate example, and he called the church to be a house of prayer. And we want to fulfill that commission, that calling, that purpose. What is accomplished through prayer cannot be accomplished any other way than through prayer. Paul said that we're to intercede and pray he told his spiritual son timothy in first timothy he said i exhort therefore that first of all supplications prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and those that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men, notice that, all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And because that is God's will for all men, what did he say? I exhort therefore that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So we see there that people being saved and coming into the knowledge of the uh, kingdom and coming to the knowledge of the truth is the result It's the fruit of prayer amen we know the word and the spirit working together the enemy wants to blind people to the truth of the gospel but prayer brings liberty and freedom it brings us to a place that we understand what the word of god is saying amen so i believe that what is happening in the earth today is god is just calling his church back to their number one priority to be that voice of prayer and intercession, amen, to make a difference that God's will for this nation would not be lost. God's will for our city and for our household would not be lost, but we would be able to see the will of God accomplished, amen. Praise the Lord. So I want to welcome everyone tonight, those that are here, with those that are watching online. In just a moment, Miss Kathy's going to come up and share what's on her heart and pray about some prayer requests. And then we're going to continue sharing tonight. And before we conclude tonight, we will be observing the Holy Communion. If you need to get your elements together for that, then you go ahead and feel free to do so during this time of sharing. Amen. And so I'm going to ask Miss Kathy to just come on at this time. And in a few moments, I'll be back and we'll move forward tonight. And just open your understanding tonight for the power, the purpose of prayer what we can accomplish, in, especially in a place of unity. I'm so pleased to see, and of course all of you know that we have a prayer call that is going on five times a week, Tuesday morning, Thursday morning at 9, and Saturday morning at 9, and then Tuesday and Thursday at 6 in the evening, plus our Friday night prayer gathering, praise God. In other words, we're wanting to be doers of the word and not hearers only, amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you, and here's Miss Kathy. I need your prayer tonight in agreement that I know what to say, and I'll be short. I have so many things on my mind, and just in the flash of a finger, I had all these wonderful sermon ideas come that could take weeks, and you know I don't have but just a few minutes, and even if I took Fletcher, the whole service, I still couldn't share those thoughts. It's such a joy to be here with you and with all of the people online tonight. It's just such a joy, just such a joy to be one of God's children. It's so once you begin to comprehend the true love and the goodness of God that he has for you, then it changes your life forever. I know in 2001, for an entire year, I listened to teaching on the goodness of God. The goodness of God. I always knew God would heal, and I believed that he could heal me, but Getting to the place that I was healed was another story. <laughs> and I remember in 1976, when my two boys needed to be healed, they were both sick, and you pick up this Bible. Now, this is the super giant print, if you wonder. Uh, what This is a super giant, and you pick this up, 
and you say, my child needs to be healed now. And on that day, I was like, where do I go? What is it that I need to understand that can change my life? It wasn't the quickest journey. It wasn't the easiest journey to understand what I needed to do personally. But it was the most profitable thing I've ever done in my life. And that's a phrase that I hear sometimes when, you know, sometimes you're just going through a time and it seems like the pain will never go away. Or I, I don't think I'm the only one that's lived in that place. And I will hear this thought, the price of life is not always cheap or easy, but it is worth it. And we know that uh, the wonderful thing about the internet today is you can find any great teaching on YouTube. Years ago, you had to pay for it, for the cassettes and all of the CD, all of the things that we would use. But anyway, not uh, doing an advertisement here. I, as I was studying this afternoon, I wanted to bring this to you. I want to read Proverbs 18.8. The words of a tailbower are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Proverbs 18.14. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. Now, the words that are spoken paint an image. Let me show you how easy it is to paint an image. I have a dog that lives in my house. As you know, when he was eight weeks old, at Christmas, the children, two boys, and their family gave us a little bitty tiny puppy. Fletcher held it on his arm. It was so tiny. How do you put an eight-week-old puppy out in the freezing cold weather? You can't do it. You just can't. And you can't give it back to your sons. So Fletcher took it home with him and did what he said he would never do. He let a dog live in the house. because he loves those boys. It wasn't that he loved the dog. He loved Mark and Chris and their family. And you know, you just can't disappoint people you love sometimes, no matter how much something might want to. Now let me paint this real clear image. Major is a brown lab, and if you don't know about a lab, they got floppy ears, and you know, they look, there's so many that look similar. He weighs about 90, five pounds. Judy has seen him. She wanted, she came visiting, and she kept wanting to visit with the dog. I previously had a golden lab, a yellow lab, and he was the most easygoing thing you've ever seen. Didn't scare anybody. So she, she just really loves seeing him at a distance. So she tells me one of the times she's over visiting, Fletcher was even home that day, I want, to see, I want to see Major. Go get him and let me see him. I said, well, you should get in the kitchen and let me fence you in so he can't get you. No. And she said, okay, okay. So uh, it would really been better to put the dog in the kitchen instead of Judy. So I have these baby gates that I use to fence the dog in like you would the child. And for some reason, he's never challenged them but once. So Judy's in the in the. Uh, kitchen thinking this little relaxed puppy is going to come out. And this 90-pound dog comes out barking and yelping and running from gate to gate around, around through the living room and the kitchen, gate to gate trying to get to Judy, barking and barking and barking. And Judy says, Kathy, get me out of here. Get me out of here. <laughs> now, is that an image for you? Did I paint that well? And if, if if you don't like it, forgive me. But if you understand how easy it is to paint an image, then you understand the process of changing the image. So as I was, uh, and, and that's what prayer is all about. Prayer is all about creating a different reality. And that different reality always comes from an image. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, Hebrews 4.12. Now, uh, as I was thinking on this, you know, we've always got to prove it with the Word of God. Amen? 
It says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man, woman, thinketh in, a, in his heart, so is he. As we think in our heart, sometimes when I want to see where I'm at, do I really believe I'm healed? Yes, I do. I do believe I'm healed. Even though sometimes my body is trying to tell me it isn't healed, and sometimes um, I feel like it isn't healed, I always speak what the Word says, just like you do. I'm speaking to the choir, as they say. But I wanted to talk to you about in Judges, you can go over there and read it. I don't have time to read it to you. In Judges 6, 11, an angel came to Gideon, and an angel said to him, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. Now, you know what Gideon was doing at that very point of time? It says he was hiding in the wine press threshing because he was hiding from the Midianites. He was afraid. He was so afraid he was threshing grain in a wine press. And the angel shows up and calls him a mighty man of valor. You see, God was determined to change his image. And the angel continued to give him instruction of what he was going to do and told him, you will save Israel. And then you go over and you'll read and you'll see uh, Gideon really wasn't persuaded, but you will find that Gideon did do exactly what the angel said. The angel came to change his image, what he was thinking in his heart and what he was seeing. And then you go over to Acts 27, 34. You all know the story where Paul and all these men were involved before the shipwreck, you know. They'd been fasting and fasting, and, and Paul came to them and said, we need to eat because uh, you need your strength. And uh, they were going to do certain things, and Paul said to them, there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. Now, we wouldn't put it in that vocabulary today or that say it in that way. It's the same thing as Psalm 91. There shall no evil befall thee, nor any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for God has given his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. I tell you, I've been sick. I've been sick before. I've been sick so bad when I wanted to crawl in bed back in 2001. And it... <laughs> Since 2001, but that was my first greatest challenge. I made up my mind, and, and you know, we all have to move in wisdom. Some people, you have to pace yourself with what the Spirit of God is saying to you. But I knew, I take care of Pastor Fletcher. I cook for him what little I do cook, enough to make him satisfied and happy. And, you know, the other things that I have to do. And I knew that I wasn't going to have the opportunity to lie around in bed and let him wait on me and pamper me and, and, you know, do all those kind of things. I knew I was going to have to take a stand of faith that I was going to have to rise up and I was going to have to speak that word and press through that season. Of course, I made him pray for me and some of y'all prayed for me, but I got through that season. But, you know, since then, there are times you just won't, this morning even, I just said, oh, just forget all the things that need to be done this morning. Let's just pull the cover up over my head and sleep to at least 12 noon. Do you think I did that? No. I was out of bed at 6.30, which was late. These prayer calls have totally changed my life. They're the most wonderful thing. But I'm out of bed now at 6 a.m., no 8 o'clock sleeping, no 7.30. But, you know, it's worth it because it's life-giving to others and life-giving to me. And so what, we, what I really wanted to talk about tonight and pray about for you and for me is being free of the past. As a child... Uh, Mother would make us be quiet, but she never made me be still. If you've ever watched me on the stage, I rarely sit still. I move this way, I move that way across my legs. I'm always doing something. I see someone saying yes, but I'm not, I talk more than I did as a child. Now, when I went to church with my mother, I did not say not one word in church until I left. 
but I could just move around all, all I wanted. She always put my baby sister between me and her so I didn't distract her. And then I had the whole rest of that role, you know, for my moving and scooting and, and all that I did. And, of course, if she ever looked at me, then I knew you better settle down. My mom was a sweetheart. I'm here today because of my mother, the kindness of my mother, the love of my mother. I married my husband. A portion of why I married my husband was my mother wanted me to marry him. And he was the kindest, kindest man I'd ever met. I love kindness. I'm never going to marry again. I won't need to marry again. I tell Fletcher, we're going to live to the rapture. What'd you say? <laughs> but it's kindness is what I look for. I like good looks like anyone else, but good looks is not going to turn my head. I, you've got to treat me good. Just ask Pastor Fletcher. You know, he was a drill sergeant and he doesn't act like that much these days, does he? Now I've got to move forward when I start talking about him and get distracted. But you see that image of words. I knew my boundaries as a child. And just like Gideon knew, Gideon knew he was a coward. Somewhere along the lines, he had been told he was a coward. He was persuaded he was a coward because he was afraid. And these men on this ship knew the ship was going to wreck. They'd been in enough storms that they knew there was going to be loss of the ship and loss of lives from what they knew of the past. But Paul tells them, not one hair of your head will be lost if you will obey me. Now, that's the hard part. He said, if you get off this ship, you'll be lost. And every one of they cut the ships off of the big ship so no one would be tempted at the last minute to depart. And his word came to pass. As you read, once they were on that island, their lives were saved. He painted an image of safety. He painted an image of what they were to do to be safe. And that's what the Word of God does to us. And when we begin, just like with Gideon, when that first word was spoken, calling him a mighty man of valor, he didn't believe that. But he was persuaded, the angel persuaded him, that he could save Israel. And what... what it says words go down in the heart and make wounds. What words are being spoken to you to cause you to have the personality that you have? I'm going to talk to you uh, about a friend, a really good friend. And I said to her, you know, when you pray for someone, God reveals things for you, not for you to gossip about, but for you to pray about. And I have had people come to me and tell me things, and I knew God was telling them to pray for me and to pray that for me, but they thought they were supposed to run and tell me. My thought was, hey, I already know all that. What are you, what are you telling me for, you know? And, and so uh, that's sort of what I've learned with God. When, he, when you have these thoughts, pray and keep praying until that, the word and the image changes, and then you have changed a person's life forever. Now, the words go down in the heart and make wounds. And I told this friend of mine, and you don't know who she is, you have to change the image of your childhood before you can change your image of today. In your childhood, you were not the favorite child. And I have to admit today, I was at the favorite uh, child. Didn't believe it then, don't believe it now, but I know my mom loved me. <laughs> I just, you know. Uh, but she was never able to persuade me before her death, even though she was so wonderful. But she could never change that image I had as a child that I wasn't her favorite. You know, some things, but you know how I could have changed that? And I can change that today. I can pick up a picture of my mother and I can say, Mom, I know you loved me. And I know I was your favorite child because we were all your favorite children. And you see, if you will do that, you will change your image. And by changing your image, is this, is this helping someone? I have to know. If, is it helping me before I keep going? God wants you to change what you see. Now, when Stephen was going to heaven, if you remember in the book of Acts, the heavens opened and God took Stephen to heaven. They were throwing stones at him, but he never felled a stone. 
because God opened the heavens and took Stephen to heaven. There's so many times when we're praying for our loved ones. There was a gentleman on the prayer call that gave this testimony. I'll tell you who he is, but uh, maybe he'll come and do a testimony one week. He said his mother prayed for him, and one night he was in an unsafe situation, and these two people were coming toward him. And he said at that point he was in a weakened state and he wasn't really able to protect himself. He said the angels literally picked him up and he saw the people begin to run and the angel literally carried him to a safe location. Now we pray for this. The gentleman is in our church. If you want to know his name, I'll tell you after the service, but I'm not going to tell it online. He did give me permission to share his testimony, but... So what I'm wanting us to pray about today is that the Lord will help you and me to change our image of ourself. We're a product, as Judy was teasing me earlier, I said, I've got to get on stage before I'm late. And my mother always said to me, you'll be late everywhere you go, even to your own funeral. I said, Mom, don't say that over me. (laughs) All those unintentional words that have brought realities in your life and mine that we want to change. Some of them are so insignificant, it just doesn't matter. But some of them need to be changed. And if, if you are struggling with a bad self-image, you need to find the scriptures that cover your situation, and you need to read it out loud and say it out loud until you believe it. And once you believe it, you will change your reality and your life around you. So tonight, first of all, we want, I'm going to pray this for this, and then I'm going to pray for, uh, well, maybe I'll do that last. Dara Henderson had cataract surgery this week, so we're going to pray for her continued recovery. Pauline Perot's sister, Marcel, we want to pray for her. Uh, Marion Williams, granddaughter Brittany was back in the hospital and her daughter Sabrina was uh, needing to recover from COVID and Dolores Bohanna needed to recover from uh, COVID. So we want to pray about that tonight and uh, I'm going to do that but let me lead you in a prayer for this. Would, Would that be good with you? All right, let's say it together. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that the spirit of truth lives and abides in me and guides me into all truth, calls me to remember things with peace and shows me the things to come that I need to know to live the life you've chosen for me. And I thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit will bring peace in every memory, will bring life into every situation, and you will teach me and show me how to change my image and the image of those I pray for. And I thank you for the healing presence manifesting in me right now, changing me, Removing the wounds that have held me in yesterday and bringing me into the truth of living the best life you have for me in Jesus' name. And as I was telling my friend, I told her, I said, as a child, you were not the favorite child. And as a child, there were things that happened, which I have no idea what they were, but it caused you to feel as though you were second. That, and through the circumstances of life, you were never first. You were always walking beside someone first. Or, or, but you just never in your heart could feel, even when God would answer your prayers and give you what he wanted, there's still this image of not being first, always being second. And I said, when you change that image, you will walk in to the peace of God that you are longing for. And you will find the contentment in your life that you are looking for. Now, does that make sense to y'all? Okay. 
I'm going to go ahead and pray because I, I, uh, it's so wonderful here. I want to thank you for letting me share with you tonight. I just really love y'all. And as I change my life, I want to help other people change theirs. And um, we move past praying for the dog to be peaceful and quiet and gentle. <laughs> you know how you prayed so much on this or that or the other. It's just easier to let him be himself. <laughs> it's just easy. I took him to the... Uh, the kennel we leave him in a place when we go out of town and and the some gentleman looked at him and said oh he is an untrainable dog he said but really he's just so full of life that's what it is I said yes I do realize that so uh, now we want to pray for these people we want to be serious again heavenly father we just thank you tonight we pray for every request on that prayer wall lord we thank you that you are going to answer every request and you're going to bring good change and you're going to bring life into every situation we thank you lord that you're going to uh, we're going to bring forth the complete healing and wholeness into the lives of Pauline Perot's sister Marcel, into Deara Henderson, into Marriott Williams' daughter Sabrina, her granddaughter Brittany, Dolores Bohannon, and every person, Lord, that is sick or weak or tired. Lord, we thank you. You're going to strengthen and heal them and make them whole. And Lord, we just love this church. We just thank you that you're going to continue to prosper it. You're going to continue to prosper the staff and all of the, the members and those who watch online. Lord, we just thank you that your spirit of truth is just going to bring the realities that we all need to comprehend with the wisdom and the knowledge. And you're going to bring all the resources, the money, but the strength in people, the strength in everything that's needed, and that you will do that for every one of your people. God, every church, that we can live in your highest and best. For you said in Deuteronomy 7, 14, that you give your people the best. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that the Lord Jesus came to bring us life and life more abundantly. And we receive that, as Psalms 112 says, we live in riches, wealth, and might. And as the book of Peter says, you have given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And, Father, you said in the book of Luke that it is your good pleasure to give us your kingdom. So we thank you today that your great peace and wisdom and life and strength and will flow into us, Lord. Thank you that those who need jobs, you'll give them jobs. Those who need promotions, you'll give them promotion. And you said in Psalms 18 to David, you subdued his enemies under him. And, Lord, we thank you. You've said no weapon formed against us would prosper. And you prayed in John 17 that we would be delivered of all evil. We receive that tonight, that all evil will have to fall. And your plan, your will, and your purpose will come to pass in our lives. And I thank you, Lord God. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Thank you for helping me tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that when you finally discovered that there is a God, that he turned out to be a God of love and that he's in love with you? Hallelujah. I was sharing yesterday at a memorial service here and just got to thinking about the love of God and how much he loved that individual and how much he invested in your life and in your future. He was not willing to face the future without you being present. Amen. And therefore, God so loved. He so loved that he redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. Amen. Father, we thank you. And Lord, for the next few moments, I want to just share from your word. And Lord, I pray this night that you would speak into our hearts and into our lives the reality of who you are, how we work together with you. You declare that we have entered into a working relationship with our Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. And as one great man of God said, without him, we cannot. And without us, he will not. Lord, I thank you for that working relationship. 
And we give you praise this night in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to, uh, if I have an opportunity, just kind of to conclude a few remarks that I started last week. And I've been sharing, I guess, the last two or three weeks. And, of course, last week most of you found out a little bit late that we were not having the Friday night prayer meeting. But we, we were, I felt led of the Lord to go to Baltimore and be a part of the uh, state camp meeting that was taking place. Hallelujah. And so, but anyway, before that, we were sharing on the three different areas of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, the fact that he is our example. Number two, he is our substitute. And number three is where we're going to go tonight, if I have an opportunity to do that. And that is the fact that he is the apostle and the high priest over the new covenant. Amen. All of those are very unique, very different, and we need to recognize and understand the significance of why some of those relate to us personally concerning being a doer of the word. And some of those is just an expression of God's grace that he has brought us back into right relationship with him that we can do the works that he's already expressed as being our example in the earth. Amen. Hallelujah. And so uh, let me just touch on those three areas for just a moment. Uh, many of you may have not been here or listening to those, and if, if that's the case, I would invite you to back up a couple of the Friday night prayer meetings and just listen to that a little bit more in detail. And so number one, Jesus is our example. That means this, that he came into this earthly realm, the last Adam, to walk in the earth and fulfill what should have been accomplished through the first Adam. God gave humanity authority. He said, I want you to guard, keep, protect, and preserve my will in this earth, protect the environment that I have established. Everything was good. Everything was perfect. Amen. And humanity, uh, humanity had been given authority to literally maintain what God had given to them. Well, we know the story. An enemy came in, deception was literally expressed in the lives of humanity, and we find out that they actually disobeyed and rebelled against the will of God. That set in motion the promise of a redeemer, and Jesus came into this earth, praise God, and ultimately we find out that he's referred to as the last Adam. He's referred to uh, because he becomes our example. And he walked in this earth as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he, he, matter of fact, he said in John 14, the works that I do shall you do also and greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. Well, what is the, the significance? I'm going back to the Father. We know that he was literally going to send the Holy Spirit into our life because everything that Jesus had in his own life to carry out the will of God is available to us today as a believer. So Jesus walked in this earth as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit, praise God. And so we find out that he was our example in this earth. He said, literally, when you go out, he said, I want you to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Well, how many of you know that sounds like a good assignment? And therefore, he's going to qualify the church, the body of Christ, to walk in that arena of authority and influence in the earth. Praise God. And so we talked quite a bit about Jesus being our example. Then we talked about the fact then there came a point in his life where he became our substitute. And how do we know that transition? How do we recognize when it was taking place? Remember up until this time, as our example, he would speak to the enemy and the enemy would have to obey. He would walk in authority. He would declare it is written, it is written, it is written. And he would walk in victory. But when he became our substitute, something happened. It says, as a lamb before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. How do we know and recognize that transition when he became silent? He surrendered himself. He became that lamb without spot and blemish that was to be offered up as a sacrifice for us. Amen. So he be entered into that arena of being our substitute. How many of you know he literally uh, was our substitute only Jesus was qualified to fulfill that particular purpose. He was the only lamb 
without spot and blemish, referring to the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus was without sin. He was, in fact, our Redeemer, praise God, to redeem us back to right relationship with God. Amen. So we talk quite a bit about that. But then I want us to talk about that third aspect of his ministry, and that is the fact that he is our apostle and the high priest. I'm going to read a few verses of scripture out of Hebrews. Matter of fact, in Hebrews uh, chapter 3, in verse number 1, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Wherefore, holy brethren, that's speaking to you, that's speaking to me, partakers of the heavenly calling. Praise God. The calling of God is upon your life. You've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Said, consider something. What are we going to consider? We're going to consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now we begin to see something totally different now is coming forth in the ministry of Jesus Christ. He is not our example at this point. He's not even our substitute. All of that has been accomplished, but now praise God, he is going to become our uh, apostle and the high priest of our profession. Praise God. Somebody asked me, well, you know, when Jesus was in uh, John and he said on the cross before he died, it is finished. Does that mean it was finished or was it not finished? Well, that aspect of his ministry, that aspect of redemption was finished. But that any serious Bible student knows that there was still a lot of activity took place in his life in order for him to accomplish the fullness of redemption. Amen. So he moved on to that next phase of redemption. But that point in time, it was finished. It was complete. Amen. Praise God. But uh, how do we know when it was finished? Let me just read a verse of scripture here in Hebrews 1, 3. It says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, hallelujah, he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Now we can truly declare it is totally finished. Hallelujah. When Jesus sat down, praise God, that means this, everything he had been sent to accomplish had come forth. He had established the fullness of redemption for us. When he sat down, that is declaring mission accomplished. Amen. But now in that position, he becomes our Lord and high priest. Praise God. Another word for that would be a mediator. Praise God. And we'll address that at least uh, to some extent. Praise God. But now let's look over in uh, Hebrews chapter 4. In the mouth of several witnesses, I like to always establish a particular truth. But looking over in Hebrews 4, looking down in verse number 4, says, hallelujah. Well, let me find the right scripture here. Uh, chapter 4, verse number 14. It says, seeing then that we have, notice that, that we have. See how personal this is? Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin are without compromise, without failure. Praise God. In other words, Jesus has gone before us. As our example, he walked in every challenge that we will ever face. He faced the enemy and he, every temptation, test and trial he entered into. How many know he stayed in that conflict until he gained the victory? Hallelujah. That's the reason why he says that you are more than a conqueror because he is the conqueror that has already conquered our enemy and our adversary. Amen. 
Praise God. So let me just read verse number 15 again. Let this just kind of soak in to your thinking. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And because that is true, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So everything that Jesus accomplished, praise God. Now, he has literally sat down by the right hand of the Father. Now he's the apostle and the high priest of our profession of faith. What does that mean? That literally means this, that he's watching over his word to perform it in our behalf. It says over in Jeremiah 1 that God watches over his word to perform that, to accomplish that, to fulfill that. Jesus said in Mark 16, he told his disciples even after he had completed redemption, he said literally to them, them go forth and preach the word and said that literally that Jesus was working with them confirming the word with signs following praise the Lord and so I want us to flip back in the old covenant for just a moment all the way back to the book of Isaiah hallelujah if I started quoting this scripture probably every one of you in here could quote this verse of scripture. And that's in Isaiah chapter 54, verse number 17. But I want us to connect this for just a moment. Isaiah 54, 17, it says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. But now, back up to the first part. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. Kathy talked about the significance, the importance, the power, the influence of words that are spoken. They've been death and life are in the power of the tongue. And it's painting the picture here that Jesus accomplished our redemption. He walked as our example. He became then our substitute to redeem us back to the place that we could walk in the example that he established for us. Amen. But now he is our Lord high priest and he he is the a high priest of our profession, what we're speaking, what we're declaring concerning the Word of God. He has been seated by the right hand of the Father. I didn't read the scripture, but it went on in uh, Hebrews 1 to talk about the fact that he is seated by the right hand of the Father until his enemies be made his footstool. Notice that Jesus is now waiting on the church to fulfill their assignment, and that is to put the enemy under our feet where he belongs. But now Jesus here literally became silent before his accusers. Remember that in Isaiah? He became silent before his accusers. But now let's bring that back in the context of redemption. In other words, there came a point in time where Jesus did not speak the word of God and walk away in victory. He did not uh, literally release the anointing of God to heal, deliver, and set free. There came a point in his life concerning redemption that he became silent. But he became silent as a part of of the redemptive work and literally he became silent before his accusers so we would never have to be silent before our accusers. Now the enemy would love to gain victory over a child of God. He doesn't want you to declare God's word. Even as our example, Jesus spoke that word and victory came forth. 
But notice this, the enemy could not gain victory over Jesus until he became silent. At one point, he told Peter, put up your sword. If I wanted to go that route, I could even now pray and the Father would send 12 legions of angels to come to my aid and my support. In the garden, they said, he said, who do you seek? And he said, they said, Jesus. And he said, I am. And they literally were slain under the power of God. He had to literally wait for them to get up to fulfill their assignment. Hey, you know, that Jesus was not a victim. He was victorious even in him uh, literally committing and submitting his life. But he became silent before the accusers. Praise God. But now when we are faced with the challenge, he said we're to hold fast our profession of faith without wavering. Hallelujah. He is not our example when he became silent before his accusers. That's when he became our substitute, where he literally was taken into captivity. And as a lamb before her shears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. Oh, hallelujah. And here, once again, it's saying no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. In other words, this is talking about words that are spoken against you, against the will of God in your life. How are we to respond to those? Well, hey, you know, we're not just to be silent. Well, I'm just going to ignore that. It's really not going to be a problem. No, let me tell you this. Why is it that the Lord instructs us that we're to be people of prayer? It says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Amen. You see, there should never be a time in our life where we just leave the atmosphere void of our words of faith and words of prayer. Because anytime we do that, we're actually yielding influence over to the enemy, even as Jesus yielded his influence over to the enemy in order to fulfill the purpose of God. Hallelujah. He was our redeemer. And he said, list that the fact that we're not to be silent before the accusers and every tongue that rises against you in judgment, what are you going to do? Thou shalt condemn. Now, this is not talking about God responding and condemning. It's talking about that person, that child of God. So we are to always have a response to the enemy. What does God say about that situation? Amen. God literally is our high priest. He, if he is our high priest, literally, that means he's watching over us. And are we doing anything or saying anything that would allow him to fulfill his ministry as the high priest? He's the high priest of what? Of our profession of faith. One translation says our confession of faith. He's watching over his word to perform it in our behalf. Hallelujah. But if we are not speaking his word, how many of you know we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind? And if the enemy can get us over into an arena of fear and speaking out words of fear, now, how many of you know we are at a disadvantage? Now, literally, we have uh, hindered the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and high priest of the profession of our faith. We have hindered him fulfilling his ministry. So every tongue that rises against in us in judgment, we should condemn those words. Amen. There should be a response. Jesus responded to the enemy by declaring God's word. In other words, he was not going to allow the words of the enemy to be established in that situation. He always came back to establish what God had to say. And when those thoughts of fear, those thoughts of failure, those thoughts of defeat, when all those thoughts come against you, don't just ignore those. There should be a response to those words. Amen. We should condemn, literally that means render harmless and ineffective against us the words of the enemy. And the last thing we ever want to do is then uh, receive those words and begin to speak out the words of the enemy. Praise God. You know, Jesus told his followers in Matthew, he said, take no thought by saying, take no thought by saying, take no thought by saying. That's very interesting terminology. How do we take a thought from the enemy by saying? 
It is one thing if the enemy is speaking that into our mind, but then, you know, we've moved into a whole different arena when we begin to sign for those words by receiving those and speaking those out of our mouth. The followers of Jesus, they had come to the place of giving up their security, their paycheck on Friday, so to speak. They'd walked away from their fishing business, whatever uh, may have been their source of living. They'd followed him. And right after that, they came under an assault of the enemy. And Jesus, not hearing that, but discerning that, turned to them and said, take no thought. Don't take that thought. Don't take that thought. Hallelujah. And, all, and the Lord is saying here, don't take that thought. Every word that is spoken against you is representing a weapon. Notice here, the, no weapon literally is referring to words that have been spoken. Because words that are spoken against you, contrary to the will of God, expressing the enemy's will, literally is described as a weapon. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment thou shall condemn. And I'm going to close this tonight. I'm going to skip over a bunch of these scriptures here, but I'm going to just jump over to one closing scripture in 1 Timothy 2. And you probably don't even need to turn there yourself. You hear me quote this, but I usually stop at verse number four. I quoted it even at the beginning tonight. But now move this over in the context now that Jesus has completed redemption. How do we know? Well, he sat down by the right hand of the Father. Now he's watching over his work of redemption, expecting his church, his body to carry out his will in the earth. What he has accomplished qualifies us to walk in the will of God in this earthly realm. Amen. Praise the Lord. And here in 1 Timothy 2, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, but a particular verse I'm wanting to get to. But it's, once again, it says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for those that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, I want us to add one very important verse to that, and that's verse number five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the apostle and the high priest of our profession. And let's bring that over in, in describing it here. He's the apostle and the high priest of our prayer life. What we're speaking, what we're praying, what we are declaring. Amen. Because you see, another word for being uh, the apostle and the high priest is the fact that he is our mediator. He sat down by the right hand of the Father, hallelujah, and this prayer that is being spoken of here, Jesus is the one seated by the right hand of the Father that is ever living to make intercession for us and another definition of that word ever liveth to make intercession for us is the fact that he is our mediator by the right hand of the Father. Praise the Lord. And he's indicating here that even though redemption is complete, even though he's already established that, what good is that going to do if his church and each individual member doesn't begin to do something with the word of God? He's watching over his word. He's the apostle and the high priest of our profession of faith. Hallelujah. And let me tell you this. He rejoices when we walk in the power of his word and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's when he's rejoicing, praise God. And have you ever noticed that when someone is healed and delivered in the Bible, that all the people rejoiced and gave praise unto God? I heard somebody say, well, I'm, I'm sick, but I'm giving glory to God 
through my sickness. Well, let me tell you, I can see many times in the scriptures where people were sick, but they did not bring glory to God until they were healed and delivered and set free. That is the results of redemption. That's the price Jesus paid for. I heard somebody say, well, you know, Jesus has already purchased my healing and I'm going to make sure he gets everything he paid for. Hallelujah. Well, I kind of like that idea, don't you? Jesus has paid for it. Let's make sure he gets what he has paid for in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask Kathy to come up. Hallelujah. And we're going to go ahead and observe the Holy Communion tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. So we're talking about the three different areas of the ministry of Jesus. Our example, you can look at his ministry in the earthly realm and see all the works he accomplished and know that's what the church is called to accomplish. But then he moved out of that arena as our substitute. We cannot walk in that area. Somebody said, well, you know, I'm just giving glory to God through all this affliction. Well, let me tell you, you're not worthy to give God through that because Jesus is the only one worthy to walk through that redemption and give glory to God. Hallelujah. But Jesus wants to be the apostle and the high priest of our profession, that we will not be content. We will not be silent before the accuser of the brethren. Isn't it interesting how he words the enemy, the accuser of the brethren? But guess what? But we have a Lord high priest who is the high priest of our profession. And we're not going to allow the enemy through words spoken form weapons against us without bringing a response and condemning those weapons. How do we do that? By declaring God's word in Jesus' name. Well, do you ever... We're going to praise God through every affliction. We're going to praise God yeah. through every infirmity because praise steals the avenger. Praise you, Jesus. We are healed by your stripes. Hallelujah. Jesus. Yes, and absolutely in the midst of those situations. Praise God. And that's another message in itself. Amen. Praise God. When we go through challenges and difficulties, praise God. Hallelujah. We can worship and praise the Lord. You know, I heard somebody say the other day, said, you know, that uh, the enemy, you know, he just wants to fill the atmosphere with his words and his thoughts. He said, well, why don't we just torment that devil and fill the atmosphere with worship and praise? Why don't we just make the devil listen to us praising God? Hallelujah. And that's one way even the challenge may come from the enemy, but even in the midst of that, before we even see any manifestation, we can glorify God and worship and praise him. Like Paul and Silas in prison at midnight, hallelujah, falsely accused, beaten. They had every reason to murmur and complain and to accuse God, but they chose to pray and sing praises unto God. And there was an earthquake showed up that didn't come from the enemy it didn't come to steal, kill, or destroy. It came from the Father to bring liberty and freedom. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, hallelujah. Just stand with me for just a moment. Let's go ahead and receive the Holy Communion. Praise the Lord. And hallelujah. Just looking at the clock here, we're right on time. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. The Holy Communion, the Holy Communion. Praise God. It's, it's our opportunity to reflect back to bring everything back into right focus. Amen. What is that right focus? Well, that Jesus is our Redeemer, that he has redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. Hallelujah. But we can easily forget that. We can get caught up in the challenges of life and forget about what Jesus has accomplished for us. But he said, as often as you do it, he said, do it in remembrance of me. Many times at, at the house, when uh, Kathy and I, we may just kind of feel a need to do so, we'll say, why don't we observe communion? I don't just pick up the bread and just immediately start doing that. Let's take a few moments. 
Let's just reflect back on the goodness of God, what he has accomplished for us. Because when you partake of the Holy Communion, you are remembering that Jesus is Lord, that he is your healer. He is your deliverer. Hallelujah. He is your conqueror. He's conquered the enemy and the adversary. And he said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. He didn't say do it remembering your challenges, your difficulties, your problems. Hallelujah. Though all of those things are very real. And you know, faith never denies the existence of a problem. Faith does something about your problem. And so said, when you observe it, remember me. Hallelujah. Remember what I've accomplished for you. And tonight as we receive this bread, Lord, we thank you tonight. Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much Lord, that you were tempted in all points such as we are. Lord, you challenged the enemy until he expired every weapon in his arsenal. But Lord, you defeated each and every weapon. And now is our high priest. You said, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. In every tongue that rises against us in judgment, thou shalt condemn. And Lord, we do so on the authority of the name of Jesus, recognizing the power of your blood. We thank you tonight. And as we receive this bread, Lord, we receive healing in our bodies, healing in our emotions. Oh, Lord, you not only had stripes where there was blood on the flowing on the surface of your skin, but bruises. Lord, that's bleeding, but it's inward bleeding. Lord, you have provided healing for the inner hurts and even healing, Lord, from those uh, areas of sickness that would bring affliction. Lord, we declare by your stripes we are healed. And you may receive the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your precious blood. We are not redeemed by corruptible things. You know what that is saying? The blood of Jesus was not corrupted by sin. Have you know God came up with a plan of redemption where he got a lamb without spot and blemish in this earthly realm as a man with blood flowing through his veins that had not been contaminated by sin. When Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. No man come to the Father except by me. And now bring that back over in connection that we're redeemed by the blood. That means literally that we come to Jesus and he is the only way that we come to the Father. He's the only way. Because if we come through the blood, he was the only one that had blood that was not contaminated. And you know, we love the Muslims, the Hindus, all the other religions in the earth. We don't have anything against them. But on the other hand, they're following after someone that has blood contaminated by sin. They could never be the only way to the Father. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The animals shed their blood just as a temporary covering to get us to the point where Jesus could be that final sacrifice. Hallelujah. With blood undefiled, he's the only one. He's the only way. And Lord, we thank you tonight in Jesus' name. And you may receive the cup. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We'll get together next Friday night. And uh, let me encourage you to come to church Sunday morning. If you're here in the area, come here. We'll be glad to have you. If you're a part of another church, go to church Sunday morning somewhere.
And we thank you for being here tonight. God bless you. All those that are watching online, we appreciate you so much. And let me just declare this night that Jesus is Lord, regardless of what's going on in your life. He is Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.